Welcome back to another episode of Crossing Broadcast. I'm your host, Kyle Pagan. It wasn't pretty, but they won. They scored 33 points, first win since Thanksgiving weekend. We've only got about 15 minutes to talk about it, so let's bring Kevin Kincaid on right now. Buddy, what how, up? Was your, how was your Christmas? Good? It was good, man. It was good. I got everything I wanted from Santa Claus. Basically, just a Eagles win so we didn't have to slog our way through another loss on here, you know? Exactly. Can't do three weeks in a row of that, you know. It was good. Kids are good. Everybody survived. Yeah. So that's really all you can ask for during the holidays, you know. And still had stuff to talk about after. I mean, this team is under such a microscope that you had the Devontae Smith linebackers coach, defensive line coach, Nick Sirianni, kerfuffle on the sidelines that we had to talk about. You had um what are some other things we we uh we had Devontae Smith's uh, kind of pissed off answer in the locker room after we had AJ Brown not talking to reporters after the game and everything. So it was a win. They scored 33 points. I think they got, I, I was happy with the win, but they're such under the microscope right now that everything is getting analyzed and it sucks. <laughs> this season sucks. <laughs> is that, that way you're at? You're still, you're still there. This season is zero fun, yeah. and I still think they go to the NFC Championship game. Mm. Mm. Because you look at it, they're probably going to get the two seed. I don't see – I think the, the commanders are starting uh, Jacoby Brissett this weekend, and then they got the Rams at home. Rams might be able to steal one, but we'll see. Um, and I think they get the two seed. Yeah. And they're kind of rounding into position right now. Keely Ringo's playing pretty well. We've never seen a healthy linebacker core since Shaq Leonard was signed. Um, Avante Maddox is now activated. They might be able to put this defense together. I know they gave up 25 points on uh, on Sunday or Monday, I guess. But uh, am I wrong to think it was kind of two fluky turnovers away from being 33-10? No, no. I mean, you're not wrong. I, I think, like, the question everybody's asking, you know, after a game like that is, did that win do anything to assuage any concerns? that people had from the couple weeks prior? Uh, no, no. I mean, that's yeah. the, a clear answer. No, it didn't make anybody feel better about anything. Yeah, people are happy for a win. But, you know, I think you take it a step further and you could say, did that, does that question even matter? Because my my thought, like I've said on the show the last couple of weeks, was that I don't think it really mattered anyway. I don't think it, I don't think a blowout of the Giants, I don't think if they won 33 to 10, say – Alameda Zacchaeus doesn't run into Boston Scott in comedic fashion or say Dallas Goddard doesn't slip and Jalen Hurst doesn't throw a 76 yard pick six. If they, if they blow out the giants by three touchdowns, does anybody really feel, does it just that would that have done enough to erase Seattle, San Francisco, Dallas? I think the answer is overwhelmingly no. No, I think people hate this team. Yeah. <laughs> I literally do think people hate this Eagles team and I don't, yeah. I can't necessarily blame them. Yeah. It didn't stop. Right. That would not stop Ford from saying that this is one and done and writing it in the comment section over and over, over again. Um, Connor's asking, where is Ford, by the way? Ford uh, DM'd me on Twitter, uh, on X, excuse me. He told me he had lunch uh, with a, he was having lunch with a friend, so he wouldn't be able to make it today. He told, so, he told you he wouldn't be able to make it? That's actually kind of all time. That's true. Yeah, Ford told me that he wasn't going to be able to listen today, but he was looking forward to John Marks coming up uh, at 1215 here. As our, well, as good our thing for Ford is you can catch it after the live show. That's how the <laughs> internet works nowadays. So thanks, yeah. Ford, if you're listening. Yeah, that's true. That's the good thing. Yeah. Um, no, but I, I don't, I, you know, I was sitting there kind of like in disgust us the whole time because like I'm I'm there on my computer at Christmas at my mother-in-law's house and I'm like man I'm I'm like a dickhead here I should just turn this off like does anybody have do I have to write anything about it I guess it was kind of, kind of a big game during a big season if the Eagles were six and you know uh 10 or whatever or if the Eagles were four and 10 coming into that game I think I would have just said let's just take this one off you know, because like my brother in law is there. I feel bad. I'm ignoring him. My kids are running around up there and I'm like hunched over like an idiot. Like and there's right nothing there. worse. And I don't know how you feel about it. There's nothing worse than watching an Eagles game with your friends, family and little kids running around. There really isn't. When you're trying to pay attention to the game, I did it on Christmas Eve last year. Yeah. We had yeah. the, the, the the one brother in law, the one cousin trying to make jokes during the game and everything. And it's just like, dude, I just want to watch the fucking game. Please shut the hell up. Well, it's tough. I mean, so what was your so what was your situation like? Were you what? Were you pissed off watching it? Were you enjoying watching it? Were you like I? I would prefer to just turn this off. 
I, I feel like I wanted to puke like half the half the game. Like it was just like, can we just shut these guys out? I'm with. I was with my mom, my fiance, and me. It was real easy. I had a real easy. Uh, okay. Game time. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was just like every time you thought they were gonna step on their necks, you know, there's Reed Blank getting burnt for a long touchdown. <laughs> It yeah. was just a weird, but it wasn't in a weird game. I mean, like DeAndre Swift had what would have been like one of the most amazing plays of the year mm-hmm. for a touchdown. But his Which I still don't think he was down. It's, I, you know, it's there. There was nothing that really could have like come up off of the ground to to show you. You know, I mean, like how's if Julian? On- how's Julian Love in last week? <laughs> and DeAndre Good Swift fun. is down. I, I don't know. I don't know. But that was a little, yeah, my head was, I was scratching my head on that one. But, you know, the Eagles hit on some ridiculous shit too. Like Jason Kelsey, you know, snapping the ball high and then Jalen Hurts running backwards and somehow finding Grant Calcaterra and mm-hmm. moving the chains on that one. And then, uh, you know, the play where they got them. When it was 20 to 18 after the pick six, first of all, by the way, that was like the dumbest sequence that I've ever seen in my entire life because Jalen Horsch tackled him. It got them. That's why they went for two because the horse tackle put them up on like the one and they just punched it in from there. So it was a two, you know, a two point game. And then they come out with a holding penalty on the very next play when they get the ball back. And then Jason Kelsey gets a false start, I guess. So they were in, that's what put him back to third and 20. And then Jalen Hurts threw what, what may have been one of his best passes of the entire season. It's what is bad it? marriage. I just, I, I just do that. Marriage, cool. Jeff. Yeah, exactly. Because it's it's exactly what it is. I, I had this like this thing just popped into my head. I think we've kind of talked about it on here, but like the idea that the Eagles ceiling, that the Eagles floor is as low as the ceiling is high. They could look like the like world beaters and make some like amazing plays. And then two plays later, like false start incomplete and they're and they're at like third and 17. You know, it's just crazy how, how to me how much um like variation there there is with it you know there's no consistency and i think that's why people can't get a pulse on this team are they good are they frauds are they you know middle of the pack what really are they and i think it's because of their consist i mean jason there's there's so much stuff that like never has happened we've seen in 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 the past like jason kelsey had some false starts but he's averaging like one or two false starts a game now there's there's (laughs) there's some throws you know that they're they're making two guys with 12 seconds left to go that Nick Sirianni comes out and says, oh, we were looking for a pass interference on that play. That's what we were looking for. Like there's yeah. just there's just no consistency from the defense, from the defensive line, from the wide receivers, from any from the play calling. The play calling continues to just be atrocious. And, and then uh, we, we it was so bad at one point that we got the run the ball crowd coming booming throughout the uh, – <laughs> throughout the link and they were and uh, Nick Sirianni said he definitely could hear him and this is the thing that I don't I don't understand because the 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 media versus the run the ball Eagles fans is one of the greatest storylines of this season you like that one don't yeah I've seen you talk about that yeah they're they're running it was I think at that point it was 20 passing versus 14 runs and then the the Eagles come out throw the pick six the next drive was mostly DeAndre Swift out of the 64 yards they had. It was 30 yards of rushing with a DeAndre Swift capped off by a DeAndre Swift touchdown. Like they came out, they ran the ball. The Giants gave up 4.7 yards, was the second worst in the in the uh, NFL for defense. And it's just like, I don't know if the media guys think we just want them to run the ball. Like you're tush push, you want them to just do 100 tush push plays, or we just want them to do. I don't think we want them to do 100 runs. I think we just want them to run the ball better or more consistently, or you know, in certain aspects. I mean. Or just be committed, be committed to it, and don't uh, don't abandon, abandon it. it. Yeah, yeah. And I think DeAndre Swift showed it that he is one of the best run, one of the best running backs this season. And every time he touched the ball, more likely than not, it's going to be a chunk play. He, I don't know if the Eagles want to save him for the playoffs. I don't know why Game Game gets so many snaps, but it's just like. Again, back to the consistency. It's like, why is Gainwell in right now when Swift has been has been playing really well? I don't know. I kind of agree with Kevin here. He says run the ball off tackle. I mean, because that's probably the strength of the, your line right now, right? I mean, with with Dickerson with with Opeta having to fill in for 
Jurgens and Dick, Dickerson in consecutive weeks, or I guess it's been three weeks to him filling in now. I mean, yeah, I mean, there was a play where Kayvon Thibodeau was kind of cheating inside. He's not yeah. a great run defender anyway, and they just beat him right off to the edge. It's like let him let him go. But yeah, you're right, man. It's not it's not like run the ball at all costs. Nobody nobody is sitting here saying like, okay, there's ten guys in the box, run, uh, line up in the power eye eye formation. You know? <laughs> <You're> probably right. <laughs> And nobody's saying that, but I think it was like, oh, was it RG3? I think you sent me that clip this morning of like RG3 yeah. coming out and saying like the Eagles have a really good like percentage or um, what was his stat? Like they gain a decent amount of yards on first and second down, but the frequency of which mm -hmm. they they actually run on those downs is low. And that's that's kind of um, – that reminds me of what the Sixers were for a long time, like especially like that first year with, with Doc, I want to say, and maybe that last year with Brett or like the Al Horford year or something where they were a pretty good three-point shooting team. Um, you know, percentage wise, they were like a top eight three point shooting team, but they shot them with like really low frequency, you know. So, you don't need to be like an advanced uh, analytics guy, you don't need to be uh, who's the die R guy, Aaron Schatz. You know, you don't have to be like a stats nerd to 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 realize that if you're good at something, you should probably try to do it more. I get where the beats are coming from. I try to play devil's advocate on that side of the argument yeah. because it's like you don't want you're not gonna you're not gonna square jam the square peg into the round hole just to say that you did it mm -hmm. but people just want to see like hey if there's an opportunity to bring the running game back or like don't 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 forget about it. that's when they say run the ball really aren't aren't they just saying don't forget about it mm -hmm. but, you know right right nobody's yeah. asking to line up and run into a brick brick wall i don't i don't think i, I think they i think it's just a fan's way of like hey you know there's multiple facets of the offense here just don't forget about the other one i don't think it's more you know more complicated than that well, here was RG, RG3 thing. They are the fourth best first and second down run team in the NFL, but are 21st in how often they do it. It's an yeah. interesting, it's an interesting stat. Well, there you go. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But I, you know, and it seemed like, you know, at least initially, like the last two weeks with Dallas Goddard being back, you know, take a three step drop, throw the ball in the middle of the field. Um, you know, the, and also the play where Jalen kind of stepped up into the pocket on nice. third and 20. Here's the thing about that, though. I will say this, going back and looking at that. The reason he couldn't flee to his right is because there was somebody on his right, okay? So all he really could do is step up in the pocket. But still, it was nice to see him step up into the pocket and, you know, throw on the move and just drop a dime over to A.J. Brown. And, like, he does – he throws a he throws a good ball, man. Like, the placement was there the other night. I mean, he didn't play this horrible game. Yeah, the pick six looks stupid, but he he threw it in a spot where he got where Goddard should got. I don't know, man. I just I keep watching this team, and I've never I've watched good Eagles teams. You and I both, man. We've watched good Eagles teams, and we've watched bad Eagles teams. I can't remember one where the the difference between the floor and the ceiling was as massive as it, as it is. I mean, there's been bad teams where the ceilings here and the floors here, and then there's been good teams like 2017 where the ceiling was here and the floor was here. But this team, they're like they. Like the Grand Canyon of of you know of gaps there, you know it's really weird. Before we get Johnny Marks on, do you uh, did you feel any solace in the fact that Brock Purdy came back down to earth on uh, on Sunday <laughs> night? Well, I'm just glad that I I feel like his uh, MVP candidacy is over, right? That, that was know? a joke MVP candidacy, yeah. 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 It now, should be Christian now. McCaffrey. It can't be Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson has 24 total touchdowns, yeah. all right? It just yeah. – you can't. 700 but, we were both, but you and I were both in agreement, right, that even if Purdy had continued to play well, that McCaffrey was still – It was always McCaffrey. Player on that team. <laughs> so it's it like always. it's like the Heisman. It's like you got to get like what the MVP has to be a quarterback now. Apparently. So I'm glad that I'm glad that that I'm glad that we have yeah answered that question so to speak. So maybe Bonte, Bonte, Hill, and Joe, what's his face, can you know shove it up their ass or whatever. So <laughs> after, All right, <laughs> after that. let's bring Johnny Marks on. Now, former ninety-four-one WIP host Johnny, how are you, man? Did you watch the Eagles? Did you take the week off? I mean, how'd it go? No, I watched them. I yeah. watched them. I think from a from a different different eyes. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I wasn't worried about what I was going to say the next day about it, but yeah. didn't make it didn't make it any more fun. That's for sure. Watching that game. Yeah, um, no. Maybe you maybe you watched it from the kitchen or something like that. Being able to like you know nosh on some appetizers while you know you had to I did, in. I did forget that they were playing Monday and not Sunday. So I was <laughs> going to the TV at like four thirty, and it's like, oh, they play tomorrow. They play on Christmas. So legit, like I forgot. 
uh, which is actually really cool to not know. Like the Jalen Hurts story came out that um, mm-hmm. that they were worried about him in the locker room and his yeah. demeanor or whatever. My brother-in-law told me, and I'm like, oh, I didn't hear it. I didn't hear about it. So it's uh, it's nice to hear these stories secondhand <laughs> instead of having to constantly look for every story out there. It's awesome. That is true. That is that is something you you definitely like. I I wish more of that. Like me, like I'm sure Kev feels the same. Where it's like, did you hear about this? No, I didn't because I didn't have to have my ear to the ground. I didn't have to keep <laughs> scrolling social media between every like AJ wow. Brown, the diva, the Eagle, <laughs> stuff, uh, the fire Brian Johnson, and then there's like one useful bit of information about Jonathan Gannon and uh, the Eagles relationship. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, listen, you win championships by running the football and playing great defense, as you guys know. So yeah. uh, hopefully they can get back to doing that. <laughs> it's not quarterback play. It's defense and running the ball. Yes. I know that if I if I didn't have to watch the Eagles or any Philadelphia sports for that instance and say I got out of crossing broad and I, I became like a, I don't, I don't know, like an, yeah, what an, would you insur- do? an insurance adjuster or some shit. Pick, pick something that's like the total op, like a park ranger. First thing I would do is that my that. phone, I'd throw my phone into the creek in the backyard because i don't need to be glued to uh twitter or x anymore looking for you know updates on the team or the latest scandal that we can uh all blow out of proportion so i guess that's got to feel nice right not not having to feel like you're like glued glued to it all the time you know yeah i mean even even when you even when you have the weeks off and you have vacation you don't really you're just so used to the routine and by the way like i still woke up this morning and went to every website that i normally do and looked on twitter mm-hmm. and everything else it's just that um, it's nice to not have to do that. And around the holidays where you kind of get caught up with everything that's going on and families in town and stuff, it was, it was cool, but I'm probably, I probably still, still have paid as much attention, almost as much attention as I normally would. I just don't have to go on the air today and talk about it, Yeah, which is cool. <laughs> okay. I was going to ask, is that, is that, is that feel weird? Uh, but you said it feels cool. So I guess you're, I mean, it just, it's, it's let's get into, it. I mean, it, not many people, leave drive time sports radio show in a major media market when they're kicking the shit out of everyone. Like you guys were, um, were there reason? I mean, obviously you, you had your, your statement and everything with the family, but were there reasons, you know, why you left beyond that or whatnot, or, and how do you feel, you know, five days, six days removed? Um, I mean, honestly, I, I think if you listen to just the, what I said in, in that vacuum, like minute or two minutes or whatever. And I know a lot of people, that didn't even hear me say it, but they read what you guys wrote on Crossing Broad, which was completely accurate and it was good. You know what I mean? It was a it was a good synopsis of. Well, I mean, you quoted me, so it wasn't a synopsis. You quoted what I said. Um, but talking about it over the course of the you know like the rest of that day or or even the, the two days that followed, um, you know, it, it was like if I could just be totally honest, it started with the family. It started with the hours. I hate how some people reacted to like, oh, he works four hours a day. Where Johnny Marks doesn't get home till seven thirty. Where you big pussy. I gotta work this and I gotta work that. Like, all right, I get it. Uh, and I didn't want it to to come off like that, right? I didn't want it to come off like I was wah. Um, but reality is that for the last seven years, I live in Collegeville. I've commuted from Collegeville in the center city to WIP. And it is a brutal fucking commute every day, both ways. It's over an hour door to door from where I have to park to, to leave in my house to where I have to park. It's unpredictable because I'm not necessarily driving during, uh, at least going to work. I'm not driving during the regular rush hour. There's accidents, there's construction. And I know more wah, wah. But like <laughs> that, that commute after seven years, really after four or five years, like I just, I was, cooked on it. I just was like, it was, I was, my quality of life has sucked the last two years. I mean, it really has. Um, and then, you know, once you get into the city and I'm trying to get to my garage and there's construction everywhere and this street's blocks. And now I'm going around, I'm driving around in circles, trying to get to my garage. And I'm, the guy's telling me, well, you can't come down this street. And I'm like, it's the only fucking way to get to my garage. You know, it's so like, <laughs> even just to get to work, it can't even be where I pull up. It's an hour long drive and I pull up into a parking spot and I can easily w- walk into work. Right. So there was that, um, you know, and, and as my kids got older and my daughter just turned eight, so I'm eight, six and two. And it's meaningful to me that I get to see them pretty much do everything. And it'd be mm-hmm. one thing if I could leave on Tuesdays and Thursdays because they have games and practices or even on Wednesdays. Like it's, they have games and they have softball games on Wednesday in the spring. 
Um, so if I could leave early on Wednesday, like even that would help, but I can't leave early. I work Monday through Friday until 6 p.m. Like that's mm -hmm. the job. I'm not working nights. I'm not Jim Gardner that worked till 11 o'clock and did the 6 and 11 every night. I'm not saying that. I'm me. And for me to be happy, I just turned 47 years old. Like I could have continued to, to work the job and to make good money and to keep doing it. But if you're unhappy, what the hell does it matter, right? True. So, so I mean, like there's more than, more than one way to skin a cat. So I figure for the amount of money I was making, my wife can go back to work. I can figure stuff out and we'll make about the same amount of money and I'll have a much better quality of life. So I've known this was coming for a year. Mm. The station, we tried to work things out. They were very respectful of the way I felt about everything. But bottom line was that, that I wasn't happy and outside of overpaying me or paying me a lot of money to kind of make up for some of that stuff. This is the only thing that was going to happen that was going to make me happy. So did either side, John, have like, were the negotiations or the talks like a real thing? If you had kind of, you know, decided a long time ago that you were probably moving on. I mean, did they, did you make a real effort in those talks and did they make a real effort in them? So I, I don't want to like, I mean, with, 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 with you know, answer so, however you choose. To. No, no, no. But like, but like th this is, like I said, there's the children thing. There's the quality of life thing. And there's the a financial thing. And the financial thing was third. Um, but it's still a part of it, right? So, like, some people will say, like, either it's about your family or it's not. But it also gets to a financial point where you say, I can't say no to that for my family, right? Like, I can't say no to that. I can pay for my kids' college. I can buy a shore house to where I can spend more time and I can commute from the shore in the summer to go up to work, right? Like, there's ways that you can get around it that help your quality of life, even though you're still doing the same thing that maybe you hate. Um, you know, like more vacation, more money and things like that. And Kevin, you reported last year when I was more or less going, uh, day to day, month to month, because we didn't have a, we didn't have a contract agreement. And I mean, I was a little bit surprised, but I guess when you look at the, the radio industry and how poorly Odyssey is performing, I want everybody that, that's watching right now to understand this, that the company that owns WIP Odyssey is $1.9 billion in debt. Now, how do you get out of debt? Well, you have to pay off the debt, right? So like next year they owe, it's four or $500 million that they owe in debt service. They're losing money on a quarterly basis. So when your business loses money, how do you pay off half a billion dollars in debt that's coming up? Well, you lay people off, you cut costs, and even then it's not doing anything. They're gonna have to declare for bankruptcy. It's a, it's a matter of if not, or it's a matter of when, not if they do it. Mm -hmm. So they had, after Angela was gone, they had, hey, we're not paying people Angela money anymore. We're not paying people Howard money. We're not paying people Anthony Gargano money, right? Sorry, cuz, to bring your name up. But like, yeah. they, they had, they had like, this is what we're willing to offer you. If you remember, like, and I'll just say this, and I don't know anything firsthand. I just, I know how to read things. Joe DeCamera, they, they knew he was going to do, he was doing morning drive. He was doing the morning show. It was taking a while to get the contract done. Why do you think that was? He's got an agent, Steve Mountain. Steve Mountain saying, hey, you're just paying Angelo a million dollars a year. Now you're offering Joe to camera this much money. No, 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 no. You got to give us more money. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't know this for a fact, but Odyssey is probably saying, this is what we have to offer. Take it or leave it. This is as much as we're doing. Yep. Joe to camera is not going to leave it. Right. It's a huge opportunity. I left it. I, mean, I left it. So the negotiations a year ago, fair offer, Right. Like nothing that was disrespectful or anything like that, because it was a fair offer. I'm making good money. You know, like I, a lot of money I make was was performance bonuses because we finished first place every book and my endorsements. And, and some of those endorsements are because of WIP in the show. The other endorsements are mine that I brought to the station or I, I've worked on. Um, so a year ago when we were doing the contract stuff, that's where I'm like, well, th like they can improve a little bit. We're not getting to the territory that's really going to help. And that's where really when I made the decision. Yeah. Yeah. And this year when we were negotiating, they definitely, they, they improved the offer without a doubt. It was not insulting. It wasn't enough for me to say, Hey, I'm willing to, I'm willing to ignore everything. I'm willing to say, you know what? Like, yeah, I may hate the drive in and I may hate missing the girls playing softball. And I may not like having dinner with them five days a week, but I can't justify saying no. I could justify saying no. And I did. Yeah. Th this, look, here's the example I would use. Um, I would I would not want to shovel shit for a career, right? But if somebody was going to pay me $3 million to do it, 
I would yeah. get out the shovel and I'd get in the truck right now. You know what I mean? So there are yep. certain things that can make it worthwhile. That's a very crude example, but it's the first thing that came to my head for some reason. But yeah, I mean, you can certainly, you know, assuage concerns about other things if you you make it worthwhile. And look, if somebody is like offering you a great amount of money, like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's best for your family. Hey, guess what? I'm going to miss soccer practice for the next three weeks, but you know, you're going to uh, a private school, you know, you're going to Rice University with Kurt Warner's son, you know what I mean? Something like that. So, but I think, I think there's a lot to unpack with what you say there, but you know, what's, what's funny, John, it's like, I, everybody's got this, everybody just looks at like the ratings and we do the radio wars post and all that stuff. And it's like, well, if, um, WIP is kicking the fanatics ass. You know, you guys have like a 19 or something. The competition's doing like a three or whatever. But yeah, the reality of the radio business and, and terrestrial radio and streaming audio and all that stuff, it's like, look, we all saw the, the, you know, I wrote the story a bunch of times about the stock, the stock delisting, New York Stock Exchange Odyssey being kicked off of there. And like the reality is like, we all, we all know, everybody knows that like the days of like Howard Stern and, you know, Angelo and Anthony and all those guys making their, you know, high six, mid to high six figures, you know, Jim Gardner, even in television, making like a million dollars or whatever. It's just, that's just oh, not well, happening yeah. anymore. Yeah. I mean, and we didn't, <laughs> none of us are naive to think like uh, there's a million people who would love to do what we do and would love to do what you do. But, you know, when you're at a certain level, I mean, you still have to look out for everybody's living their own life and you got to find your own quality in it. You know what I'm saying? I'm never going to sit here and say like, woe is me because, all you know, I just log on and say what I want to say and and write whatever I want to write every day. It's an amazing job. I would love to do it. I was still sitting there on Christmas night in front of a computer, you know? So, I mean, still everybody, a job. Everybody's, got their, everybody's got their own. Yeah. I'd be interested to ask, uh, John, did the grind of it and everything and, you know, every single day, obviously you have your opinions and the people who call in have their opinions and the people you work with have their opinions. Did it never make you fall out of love with sports in a way? Uh, you, you definitely don't look at it as a fan as much. Yeah. You guys know this. It's all about what, what makes the best story, what creates the best content, right? Like if the Eagles win a game and, and here's the thing with, with, with radio, I don't know how it is with you guys and clicks. It's easier to do a show when the team loses more people listen when they win, but it makes it really? more challenging when, you know, the Eagles last year are undefeated and we're complaining about them because they're not winning by, you know, they're, they're whatever, like this year, they're not winning by enough points. And actually, it, it, it was something that we should have uh, we should have been paying probably closer attention to how they were winning this year. But yeah, I mean it 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 um it takes away from being a fan a little bit. But um you know it, like Kevin was just saying, it's a job. You know, it, at the end of the day, it's a job. It's not easy. You guys know this. But like we we talked about Jim Garner. Every night, Jim Gardner says, but the big story on Action News is, what if there's not a big story? Do they not say the big story on Action News? No, they have to have a big story, right? So every day, whether it's us pounding the Eagles into the freaking pavement or whatever the hell we're going to talk about, we got to talk about something. We got to talk about something that's compelling enough for people to listen to. So yeah, I don't feel like talking about, I don't feel like talking about shit five days a week. You know, there's a lot of days I don't feel like talking about anything, but like, that's the job. So, so I've done this. I my first full time job in radio was 2006. I was a morning show producer at what, at the old 950. I've been doing full time radio in Philadelphia since 2006. And 950 and now, for people who don't know, 950 was the old AM sports uh, pre fanatic days. Yeah. So it was it was I, I worked with Glenn Foley mm -hmm. and Greg Henson, who lasted nine months before they whacked him. Then they brought in Michael Bradley. I worked with Michael for a year with Glenn Foley. Then they got rid of everybody and they went to 950 ESPN. And that's when the ESPN affiliation started. And that's when they brought Mike Missanelli on. That was April, 2008. Yeah. And working with, so I started working with Mike in April in 2008. And then the fanatic, I don't even know how long, maybe like a year or two years later, it went FM. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, so like I, I've been, I've been doing this for a long time and I'm not Angelo. I'm like Glenn Mack now. I can't do the same thing for, for 30, 35 years straight. <laughs> I, I can't, I can't. And seven years of doing WIP, driving in there every day. The show with Ike and with Jack, like the tough part about leaving was the show, was because like Ike's great, he's awesome, he's great to work with. He certainly elevated me more than I elevated him. You know, like he helped improve my brand. Uh, and Jack is, Jack's great, Jack's gonna be, Jack's already a star, but you know, Jack is gonna do great things in the future. The show was never a problem. There was there was never a problem with the show, and yeah. and and Kyle, that's the difficult part is telling Ike I'm leaving, and for him to not think 
well, if he really likes the show and he really likes working, like, well, how can you leave? Because that's what a lot of people said to me was, people don't leave shows like this that are this successful. Like, what are you doing? My mother didn't support me leaving the show. <laughs> Honest to God. She, my mom told me that there's not one person she spoke to that thinks I'm doing the right thing. <laughs> Honest to God truth. I got My wife pretty much was the only person that supported me in leaving. Yeah, but you know so, the thing is, John, it's, it's one thing to leave a successful show, but I mean, you don't have something specific like lined up. I know you tease that you've got some business opportunities and things like that that you're working on, but it's not like, you know, it, it, it takes one thing to, to take that leap, you know what I'm saying, and not have like a super like locked in, like, okay, here we, I mean, at least that's what it sounds like to me, right? Oh, to, to leave a, a job and be unemployed with three young kids and a wife that's not working. See, for all the, all the people out there, and I'm not a comment reader, I never check my Twitter mentions. Really? People are so, people are so fucking mean. Yeah. And you know, the last time I checked, I checked my Twitter mention, some asshole, I was sitting in my, in my driveway and I have cameras and stuff. So they know when I get home because the camera goes off. So my kids are waiting inside for me to come in and I'm arguing with this guy on Twitter. I don't even remember what it was. And I'm literally, so I send the tweet. He immediately gets back to me. And my wife calls me and says, what are you doing out there? And I'm thinking like, what am I doing out here fighting with this guy on Twitter? But anyway, so I mean, Instagram is, is you know, far less toxic and people are generally nice. But I had family and friends that told me, oh, the comments are roasting you on your, on you, on your video of you leaving. And I was like, really? I'm like, all right, well, I kind of expect that. But the one thing that they said that I actually want to address right here is my wife was the one that was behind me leaving and she was pressing me to leave because she wanted me to leave and she didn't want me coming home, blah, blah, blah. So let me just, let me just set the picture for you guys. My wife, who had a great career before she stopped working to take care of the kids, hasn't worked since before COVID started. We don't have a ton of savings. Um, and I have three young kids. I'm diabetic, by the way, which is very expensive to, to take care of the diabetes. So if anybody out there thinks that I left the job because I was being pressured by my wife, so now we both have no jobs and we don't have a lot of income and I don't have health insurance. So I think you maybe want to rethink that my, because believe me, there was like, I had to tell my wife on a lot of occasions, like, Hey, listen, you trust me, right? All right. If you trust me, just like when I left the fanatic with no assurances and ended up going to WIP. I said, trust me. She trusted me and it worked out well. So this will work out for us as well. But she had like the idea that she was pressuring me to quit so she could go back to work and we could make far less money than I made at WIP is silly. <laughs> well, I mean, but sometimes you got to, And sometimes you got to just jump into the deep end too. You know, I mean, cause you could sit there and you could waffle yeah. and be like, well, you know, you could do another year you know, and just do the year to year thing and kind of just keep kicking the can down the road. But like, sometimes you don't really get to where you want to go unless you like, just do, just do it, you know, mm -hmm. and then yep. you know, things work themselves out and whatever. But I, I got to say, man, you know, like you're saying that the comments were all, or people were saying it was all negative. Like people saying, what are you doing or whatever? Well, so, well some people I, said that. Some people. Okay. Some people, I'm going to go in the opposite direction. I give you credit for, for doing that, man. Cause it takes, it takes guts to do, do something like that to up and walk away from something that's good and something that's successful. You weren't walking away from a show that got a 3.2, you know? Um, and this is WIP. I can't remember the last time anybody's willingly left PM drive in this market. I know, I know Natalie was like, co it was a third mic, I guess with, with, um, with Miss Anelli. But yeah, I mean, like people sit in those shifts for, for a long time. I guess Chris Carlin went back to New York. That was another thing. But that but, was, uh, that was a promotion to get to WFAN. Yeah, to your, yeah. Point, he, to yeah. your point, he had something lined up, Yeah, but I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Yeah. And so I said to my wife, do we really believe that I'm not going to have interest from somebody out there? I mean, you also have to like, if the fanatic doesn't have interest in me, if yeah. all city doesn't have interest in me, if there's not somebody out there that's trying to start a digital thing or whatever, I'd be, I'd be shocked. Right? Like I, I have sponsors that, that have been longtime sponsors of me that I think will go with me no matter where I go. Like I, I've done well with ratings. I'm, I'm, I'm listen, I've had two radio stations now let me sign off the air. So I, th I think that speaks to what they think of me personally as an employee and as a person. But generally in radio, if you say I'm not coming back, they whack you. And it would mm -hmm. have been easier if they would have done that to me because I wouldn't have had to say the freaking goodbye. Yeah. I would just been like, whatever. But it was important to WIP. And I, it means a lot to me that they wanted me to give a proper send off. You know, Mike, Mike missed when he left. He gave, what, what an hour? He's like, I'm done at six o'clock today. 
Mm-hmm. And yeah, I always yeah. felt I always felt bad for his audience because it's hard for for some for people that have listened to him for that long the process that I get one more hour of Mike and then he's he's gone right. So I wanted to give them at least a couple of days to say goodbye and to have a proper send off since the station wanted me to do that. But it's it's a hard thing to do. It is. Yeah, I'm sure it, it's got to be crazy. I, I I saw a comment come up and. This is why I, I really liked you guys and goes back to like you guys leaving. Like I I, I always liked you were only, you were the only I don't listen to the last words right now. You're the only one that I could listen to because there was no shtick, no gimmick, no nothing between you, Ike and Jack. And that's what uh and you leaving, I mean, I feel like that's uh, at least you gave those people forty eight hours to uh to give you the proper send off. How hard was that uh saying goodbye, man? It can't be easy when you're right on the mic and you're like, All right, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. I ch- I choked up uh Took up twice. I didn't. I don't think I actually cried, but yeah, it was because um, the other thing is when when you're saying it, you don't want to say the wrong thing. Yeah. Right. You, you don't want to come off as being an asshole or sounding like I, I I don't know. So you're also like I don't want to bring up financial stuff when I'm respecting the radio station. And I had a lot of people reach out to me and be like, I know this is because of money. Listen, it's always about money. They would have paid me a million dollars a year. I wouldn't be sitting here right now talking to you guys. Right? But it, it, that doesn't mean that it, that family also doesn't matter. I mean, like our 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 catchphrase on this show is that more than one thing can be true, right? Mm-hmm. And it was, and yeah. and I would say I would say financially, number three was like th- this is a, like this has been a, this is a year. Like I knew this was over a year ago. I knew that they were only going to go. I I knew they were only going to go a certain um, a certain amount, and I knew that that wasn't going to be enough. And we talked. And it just, you know, I just knew that it wasn't going to happen. And they were, they were great. I can't say enough about, I can't say enough about the management at WIP. They're awesome. Everybody that I worked with, the staff, Ike and Jack, everybody, everybody's great. So, I mean, that's the tough part is that you get close with people over the course of however many years listening or, or, or working with them. And now it's kind of like, like that, it's over. So in a normal job, it's, it's just like, oh, well, he's going to get another job, whatever. In this job, it's a little bit different. So yeah. let me let me ask you the most basic question I can ask. If you if you could do, I think this is from Office Space. Isn't this a question from Office Space where they say if you didn't have? Well, no, maybe that's not the greatest question. What would you if you could do anything right now? What would you What would you do? What do you want to do? Win the lottery and not work. Well, no, not that. Again. I mean, like oh. you have to you have to work. What would What do you want to do for a job? Like if you could pick your job, if you could pick your next role out of a hat right now, I mean, what would you want to do? Whatever I do, I have to feel like can be successful. Um, I feel like that at 47 years old, man, like if I could just get five more years out of radio and it's kind of set myself up with other things, like I talked about having other business interests, I'm working on opening, opening up a barbershop in Phoenixville coming up in the summer. Um, But like, and I, I think this was a, this was, this was something that, that Kyle Scott had said when all city started up which is that, right? Like I'm not a, I'm not a pat podcast guy, right? I've done, I've always listened to, to radio since I was a kid. I've always wanted to be on radio since a kid. The podcast form is much different. So I would have to relearn and I could do it. I'd have to relearn kind of like a, a whole new thing. Um, I listen to a lot of audio on demand. I don't listen. I listen to true crime podcasts. I don't listen to a lot of sports podcasts and things like that. Um, so, I mean, I think terrestrial radio would be my ideal thing. I mean, honestly, I wish we were, I could go on a time machine back to like 2005 because the whole all talk of everything, not just sports talk is really what I want to do. There's just not anywhere to do it right now. Are you making reference to the, uh, the WISP phase where they were, uh, I think they Man. did like a little bit of talk, a little bit of music, like a little bit of everything. I want to want to say they had like a thing for a little bit where it's just like, you know. So there's a there's a station in in Dallas called um, the Freak. It's owned by iHeart. Uh, the old program director from the Ticket. The Ticket is the big sports radio station in Dallas. Yeah. So the program director that kind of was like Tom Bigby uh, of there, like he he invented it, he developed it, and then he retired. He came back and he's on this this station, The Freak, where they're a combination of sports, general talk, just radio, like right? good talk radio. And I think they play like maybe a song or two an hour or something like that. So to, I guess to finally get around to answering your question, I could see myself doing a show that had maybe a, a song, like two songs an hour, 
and then talk like legit ballsy talk, like not sanitized stuff. It could be sports, something like that. I mean, that would be my dream to do. I just don't know if that exists anymore. Well, to and to just to piggyback off of what Kyle was saying too, I really think that what he was touching on is really a, a key thing and was really understated. You know, when I would listen to, you know, you you know, I would listen to the show. I mean, I call I called in a bunch. You know, I didn't call lately. I don't know why, but um, you know, I called in a bunch and I would you know I'd have you guys on when I was in the car yeah, and picking yeah, up the kids. Yeah, you texting me, texting me when you're driving. I, I did at a stoplight. At a stop. uh, touching and driving at a stop at a stoplight at a stoplight yeah my phone by the way does a thing where when my bluetooth is turned on if somebody texts me while i'm driving my phone responds and it says i'm driving so then I, people I've seen that before yeah yeah so like people get all freaked out They're like <laughs> oh i don't want to interrupt you or whatever it's like no i'm literally sitting in my parking lot it's just, or sitting in my driveway <laughs> but the thing the thing is you know on but uh but no i like for real man i i didn't i never got the sense that like you and um ike and jack were like making shit up to make shit up or like doing the hot take doing the radio hot take thing like it, it felt it felt pretty um authentic to me and i think you can do that when you have good chemistry but i mean were you guys aware of of that that people would would think like i'm not just really getting the the radio bullshit hot hot take artist thing here when they when they would turn you guys on um i mean so i don't think i don't think i'd be saying anything out of line to say that when, when when I came to WIP and Spike kind of rebuilt the station, it was a lot of first take ish, Skip Bayless stuff. And you know what I think for the station to reestablish itself, it was important. And you can't you can't argue with the success that it had, right? Yeah. Um, but from there, and I think after Spike left, I I don't always want to have to have a contrary opinion to to Ike or to Jack because. I think people see right through it and it becomes predictable. So if something happens, you know, like I don't want to do the, the Eagles suck. Do you agree? Two and five, five, nine, two, 94, 94. Ike, what do you think? The Eagles are great. Oh, well, I, I disagree. The Eagles suck. No, right? Here's no. why. Right. Like I don't want to do that every day, man. So like, and I don't think people want to hear that every day. So I think you can't, you have to have opinions. That's important. But to me, it can't be predictable to where every day you're tuning in and you almost know what's going to happen. Marx is going to say this, Ike is going to say this and whatever. So I feel like we've really evolved from that over the last couple of years. And maybe it's contributed to, to the success of the show. I'll tell you this, Mike Miss leaving, I think the fanatic underestimated just how much of an effect that would have on afternoon drive. And I think Tyrone and Ricky are doing a good job. But a lot of people, I've heard from a lot of people over the last week that said, you know, I knew you were over at WIP. I listened to you with Mike, but I didn't really come over and start listening to you until after Mike was off the air. And that's really, I think, where we really grew our audience to where people were like, hey, man, this is great. We love this show. Yeah. So do you think, do you think Philadelphia, are they a two sports talk radio city? Do you think so? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. If I was to take over the Fanatic right now, if they were to hire me as program director, I would almost. I would almost have a bar stool model to it where I would be the program director and I would also be on the air. I would be the Dave Portnoy to where I'd be involved in everything and everybody would be involved in everything. Um, the Fanatic is probably never going to beat WIP, right? Especially right now, they're the flagship to the Phillies, flagship to the, to the Eagles. And you see what the numbers look like when it's during Eagle season. I mean, in Jesus Christ, look what happens when the Phillies are in the playoffs. They're doing 20 shares. It's unbelievable. Um, but I think there's more than enough market for people that maybe want, want a little bit less sport ish or sporty stuff and a little bit more of inside it surrounds it's surrounding sports and it's a sports culture, but it's really kind of, you're creating your own culture. And that's what I think the fanatic needs to get back to, which is just becoming the fanatic, becoming the fanatic again. And they have plenty of talent there. It's not that they, it's not that they can't do it. I think they can. Um, but I think a new focus and some new ideas will really do them well. Now we talked about it on the show. I mean, they should dive into this, their, their personality. Like you just have to be person. You should be on, you know, and I've seen WIP get on, you know, more Instagram, more TikTok, and all that stuff. But, you know, they, they, they had a, they, I thought they did a great job with the YouTube. Uh, they were first to that in, in, in the city and stuff. And they were getting extra eyeballs on that. Maybe a younger audience on that. And I always thought about the fanatic as like, you know, you're 18 to, to 34, uh, and WIP is your your uncle from Delco who who listened to it and everything. Obviously, those ratings are uh, have proved to be otherwise in the last uh, couple of years. But 
I, I 100% agree with you on that, where it's like you just got to dive into your personality. Everything has to be on the uh, on, on, on the floor there. So I think you got it. Good idea. I, I think um, it was funny, you know, the interactions with, um, you know, I would call in and we'd, you know, have our little thing with like, you know, Chuck and the and Ingy and the and Mad Mike and all the cars, you know, Chuck, Chuck from Manor. Kevin, Kevin Kincaid can kiss my ass. You know? and I think Mad Mike told me to kiss his ass. I think multiple callers to the Marks and Reese show told me to kiss their ass. But, uh, you know, it was um, I, I always thought those were there were fun and whatever, because we were just kind of kicking it and everybody was just you know, having a good time or whatever. I don't really think Chuck from Mount Airy should kiss my ass, but I didn't want to hear him every single day. You know, um, do you, how, how do you, how did you like, uh, what, what do you, what, how, what do you look, like think about all the, the caller like stuff now having the, having the regulars and all that, because your show became kind of known for, you know, those guys being on the line every single day, Herb, uh, Chuck, Andy from Deptford. Yeah. All those dudes, yeah. Yeah. I, I like the, I like, I like the callers. Um, I, I grew up listening to Howard Stern. Um, uh, to me, everybody raves about his interviews and blah, 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 blah. To me, the best Howard Stern is when they're just talking about bullshit and you're getting whack pack callers. And we really developed our own whack pack on the Marks and Reese show. And it's probably what I'm, I, what I'm, I'm most proud of is, is what we turned our audience into to where Bryce Harper's shouting them out and hitting a home run for them. Yes. Yes. And, I mean, when you see, get it to that point, I'm like, think about what they have created here. I mean, they have Bryce <laughs> Harper shouting out Chuck from Mount Air, Mount Airy. I right. thought my head was going to fall off, but I was like, well, it's pretty admirable that they may turned him into a, you know, yeah. I felt so, bad so, because Herb, what was up with Herb? I was listening to his last phone call. It sounded like he was on his deathbed or something. Um, I, I tried to text him. I don't think he texts. So I got to call him to see. Someone actually messaged me today and said, "How's Herb?" And I haven't listened to I haven't listened to WIP, so I don't know if he called in in there or not. Um, hope he's okay. But yeah, like like I, I mean, listen. If I was to do a sports radio show again on WIP, you are going to get things that are caller driven, right? Like I think one of the things that that when when John Kincaid came to the fanatic, he was very anti caller. I don't think you. I think it's how you use the callers, right? So everything that we do on WIP is to is to get reaction from the callers, right? So what you're talking about really is just to get phone calls, right? You don't have to do phone calls. Like you don't have to do your show based on phone calls. You can take phone calls without having to put out a topic that's going to get people to respond one way or another. So like if I was if I was doing mornings, if I was doing mornings on a sports radio show, I'm not doing I'm not doing caller driven topics so people can call in and say, Oh, I think the Eagles suck, or I think the Eagles are great, or like to spin the wheel. Yeah, yeah. Now, I don't care what, what your favorite movie is that starts with the letter P. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't want side topics or anything like that. I don't need people, I don't need callers to do that. Um, but I do think, like, for me, for any show that I would do, uh, the callers and their personalities are who I want. I don't. If you take 50 calls or you take 40 calls or 30 calls in a day, you're going to get a lot of bad callers. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. At least yeah. with the regular callers, you know, know what to expect and people know them. And they may bitch about them like you do, Kevin, or other people. Well, that's that's but, that's and just so everybody's clear here, I'm not I'm not really anti caller. I'm just anti shitty caller. Like, I don't <laughs> think that Mad Mike offers anything to the show because Mad Mike says the same thing every single right. time. Right. Like, oh, Joel Embiid sucks. He's a loser. You know, Howie Roseman, know. put him back in the broom closet. Kevin Kincaid sucks. He's a loser. And they're never going to win anything with Joel and B. And, you, and John, you've hung up on Mike multiple times. So you, I, I think <laughs> yeah. you can kind of agree with this. It's a no. So what you need to understand is that not everybody likes it and people will, will tune out. And it, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a fine line and it's a balancing act of not doing it too much, not yes. bringing them on too much. Mm -hmm. And because you will create a tune out. Versus well, you like, crazy, I mean, you can do, listen, man, I, if I've learned anything in 40 years, like whatever, you can apply this principle to anything you do in life, whether it's dieting, um, whether it's exercising, whether it's programming a show, writing stories on a website, you can do anything within reason or like in moderation, right? So is there, can you, is there such a thing as too many callers? Probably. But you know, like you say, you mentioned John, his show didn't have any callers and maybe, and they switched a couple weeks ago and they started taking phone calls. So, I mean, there's always like a, a middle ground with, with that kind of stuff. You know, I'm, I'm aware of that on the website, you know, I'm like, Oh, I, I did 
five six years posts in a row and maybe people don't want to read about that right now I'm just trying to find find a middle ground for everything try to find a balancing of you know act on that kind of stuff so no I, I just i think my thing with the callers was always like you know i write those stories tongue-in-cheek on the website i think everybody knows what we are at this point there are some people who do not realize what we do um, but even though they're written tongue tongue-in-cheek there's always a they're based on yeah. truth i don't hate chuck from mount area i don't i don't want chuck from mount area to, i'm not going to pull my pants down and tell him to kiss my butt if i see him in in person but like yeah i, I would prefer if i only heard from you like once instead of five days in a row but i'm never gonna i'm never gonna be like one of those people who's like you know you it has to be zero of this or a hundred of this because i think the best of everything is when you kind of pick and choose and mix and i mean shit man you guys you guys were doing 20 hours a week you know yeah. not 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 counting commercials and cars and all that stuff talking about largely talking about the eagles kyle and i did 15 minutes of the eagles this week no. I was like, all right i think we're done yeah, yeah you guys just stretching that <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's it is um, you know, like t Tom Bigby when he ran WIP, he used to have a a, a button in his, in his office that he used to be able to drop callers, and he had the producers that had an hourglass. You couldn't be on the air for more than two minutes, and he would drop you, period, because whatever whatever study or whatever some consultant said that people leave after two minutes. And yeah. when I when I first started working in in radio and being a host, I was told the same thing: like you're having callers on for too much, which I think is fine if it's a caller that's trying to call and talk about sports like mike in northeast philly that's a terrible caller yeah you don't need to be on longer than two minutes but isn't that I'll a have... perfect example of what i was just talking about if you have a good caller then you don't have to hold them to two minutes if you have a crappy caller then the rule like it doesn't have to be a one size fits all kind of thing it doesn't have to be tom bigby sitting there like he's like the james bond villain like ready to press the button and dump him into the shark tank or whatever you awesome. know Herb would be on seven or eight minutes sometimes because, yeah. you know, I mean, why not? You know, he was entertaining. People, yeah. People love him. So, yeah. But, but um, yeah, it, it is, um, it's a balancing act, but uh, it was a lot of fun. The callers were fun. If, if WIP opened up a morning or an afternoon show, could we see John Marks back? We're in the future. Um, I, I actually, I actually pitched them on the last, like over a year ago, to doing a daily WIP podcast on top of doing afternoons because I felt like I needed to do something else, um, and they felt like they were cannibalizing their own product by doing it. Which, you know, I even said like, hey, if I don't continue at the station, what if I did a daily WIP podcast? It could be two hours, could be whatever. Like, let me create something, you know, like then I, like I can sell it. I can have advertisers. Like I think it can really grow and they never showed any interest in it. So, um, I mean, as far as afternoon drive, no, I'm not working afternoon drive anymore. Uh, but as far as, you know, in the future, going back to WIP, I, I would never say that it couldn't happen. We left on, on good terms. Um, you know, I, everything is fine as far as I'm concerned. So, I mean, I, I don't see why I couldn't in the future, but no, I hadn't really thought about that. I did write down my Mount Rushmore of callers who annoy me. I've got Mad Mike uh, on there for obvious reasons. I've got Ingy. My problem with Ingy was that Ingy would always have this take that he thought was like super cutting edge and super smart. Like nobody had ever thought of it but him. He'd be like, what, th what they need to do, listen. They need to run the ball. Well, like no shit. We're all we're all saying the same thing. But he would like think it's some amazing proprietary thing that he came up with, and that was his thing. Um, Chuck is on there, and then redacted from Deptford. I would put him on there too. I mean, there's a lot of good ones. I liked Herb. I liked uh, the guy from Tennessee with the great accent, uh, Justin. Uh, uh, Justin. Justin. Yeah, not Bob. Justin. Um, but anyway, um, so that was my exercise. My Mount Rushmore of uh, callers who annoy me. Um, Andy and Deptford, Mad Mike, Ingy, who he just stops calling. We'll, ha we'll have a call where I hang up on him or whatever, and he yeah. stops calling. I don't know if he's away in a hospital or or whatever. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not joking when I say that. Um, it's not funny, but I'm not exactly sure. He'll disappear. I'm not sure if he's mad at me or – and he'll resurface on Twitter or something. And I'll be like, where always, have you been for the last six he months? He would always sound like he was like sitting by himself in like a dark room or something. He, uh, he did. Yeah, I've it was a mental Ingy. institution. <laughs> I've, met, I've met Ingy. A yes, I agree with you, Kyle. I've met Ingy on a couple of occasions. So yeah. uh, he's a nice enough guy. But yeah, I'm trying to think of any, any other uh, uh, annoying 
Cause sometimes annoying can be good. Sometimes it can be bad. And like you said with Mad Mike, like when the Eagles lose, that's when I might want Mad Mike on because that's when he's at his best. <laughs> well, just a, just have him come on and ramble. Yeah, I just feel yes. like he did the same Embiid line. Embiid's a loser, you know. Yeah, he did. Or, you know, it's funny you mentioned the consultants earlier because when I was at Eyewitness News, it was like the same thing. But they would – I remember I got in a big argument. I actually got disciplined once by an executive producer because he told me to lead with weather. And there was like a shooting in the city that same night or whatever. And I was like, fuck this. I'm not doing the weather first. Like there's a shooting. The shooting is bigger news than like the forecast. And who, was I got, your, who was your me- meteorologist at the time? Um, <clears throat> I think Kate Bilo was – Kate Bilo? Yeah. So well, let's, um, let's go to Cape Bilo for the forecast. Hey, four people gunned down in Philadelphia, but the big story on eyewitness news, let's get that first forecast from Cape right. Bilo. Exactly. Know? Yeah. And it was just, it's, I got, I got in trouble with that shit a lot though, because I would, I went on Twitter. People were like ripping the meteorologist, like Howard Eskin style saying like, they can't get their, they can't get the forecast. Right. And I would be like, you know, it's not them who decide to go up for, they're not the ones who decide to open the show and stand up there for three minutes. That's the con- consultants telling them that in the biggest television market on the planet, the only thing that everybody cares about is the the weather. You know what I mean? Even though I can just get it on my phone. So I'm right there with you. Man. I've, I've, yeah, I've been through all that too. But I, I mean, again, it was like, those were great jobs or whatever. But I mean, one person's situation is different than another person's situation. That's why I give you credit, man, for not for, it takes a lot to realize when it's time, man. I mean, like, you could be some musician who releases like four amazing albums and then you're like, oh, you know, I don't really know if I love this anymore. I want to keep doing it. And then you release like four shit albums. You know right. what I'm saying? Like it's, it's commendable to say like, you know what? I'm done. I'm going to see what else is out there. You know? So I give you credit for that, man. Who's, uh, who's next up at WIP? Other like who, who, uh, if you had to tap anyone. Jack. Well, yeah, that's an obvious one. Jack. I just don't know. I, and, and they didn't tell me anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I even was like, well, you guys should at least say like an announcement's coming up because it was kind of like I'm leaving and no one else is saying anything. And I'm like, well, what's going like, at least tell people it'll be so like, all right. So then Rod told me you can say that the announcement will come after the new year. So I'm like, okay. So that's why I eventually said, I just don't know who else. I don't know who else you would hire. Uh, you bring on a, another producer that probably has some good on air chops and you make Jack the, you know, have Jack slide into the role. I mean, the show's set up for success right now. Um, so I think Jack will do a great job. Uh, do I know that? No. Do I, would I be shocked if it was somebody else? Yeah, I'd be shocked if it was somebody else. What, uh, what else do you want to tell the people while we have you? All right. So, um, I'm still doing part-time CBS sports radio stuff, which is owned by Odyssey. So again, it tells you like, they were like, yeah, you can keep doing your CBS sports radio stuff. That's fine. So I'm still doing that. Uh, you can't find it in Philadelphia, but you can find it just uh, Google, listen live, CBS Sports Radio. Uh, I'm on Sunday nights, the primetime hours of 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., just when everybody wants to uh, be working. Uh, I'm you actually a lot doing of truck drivers. Are there a lot of truck drivers who listen to that? So I, 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 worked, uh, I worked overnight. I did, I did overnights for two years. It was Saturday and the Sunday, 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Eastern, and it was by far the most fun I've ever had doing radio. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Ingy uh, from Marietta, Georgia. You're on the line. Yeah. So you get like the problem with working network radio is like, let's say that you're doing afternoon drive at network radio, three to six, two to six or whatever. For the most part, a lot of your affiliates are in local programming because just like um, just like 950 when they were on the AM, they had ESPN programming and then they had an afternoon show and they had whatever. So you could be doing mornings on CBS Sports Radio and you don't have anybody listening to you. When you work overnight shift, you're cleared in every market but Philly and New York. So you may have less listeners, but you have you're on every station. Everywhere. So we we grew a we grew an amazing it was an amazing audience. It was awesome. I used to go I used to get a ton of phone calls. We had a fun show. But then like working those hours just became a little bit too much after two years. So I, I was able to switch to this ten to two shift, ten PM to two AM shift when um Are you live? When it opened up. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh yeah, taking phone. Oh yeah, taking phone I, calls, doing it from my basement, doing it right here. So I did a heavy uh, metal. I did a heavy metal show in college that started at midnight, <clears throat> and this guy from prison would write letters to me, and he would have yes. a list. He, he would have a list of songs that he wanted to hear. He wanted to hear like Pantera or something. And he but he wasn't allowed to call, I guess, from prison. So I would be like, you know, Bobby is in like the county slammer. He wants to hear, 
mouth for war. You know, <laughs> you but it was fun. I got some like randoms, man. It was, it was cool. Ben you know? yeah, I, get, <laughs> I, I get, I've gotten, I've gotten a ton of prison letters, mental. <laughs> There's a guy, he's, he's not listening right now, I'm sure. But he's in he's in the Trenton State Hospital or whatever, and he's he sent me. I, I saved I saved the last one too, just so I had it. I love um, it. Yeah, so you get that. So I'm I'm still doing national stuff. Um, I had I'm still have to talk after the New Year's. I said just let me get back to the New Year's. I have a lot of stuff going on, but like I, I'm probably gonna start doing some TV stuff. I can't really say what that is right now. It wouldn't be a ton, but it would be a little bit. Um, and then from there, it's a matter of, I got a three month non-compete. Uh, so I can't, I can't legally work or speak to anybody until April 1st. Mm -hmm. So after April 1st, I would say that, you know, look out and hopefully I'm back somewhere not long after that. Uh, and if I'm not, I'm in big trouble because I don't have a lot of money to last me. <laughs> much past that and uh you know and, and I, my wife may be going back to work she may not be but you know like i'm fucked if i don't if I, someone's not interested in me by april so nah you'll figure it out man i got shit canned by channel three and i went and worked in a restaurant for a couple months and i loved it i was like this is so right. different i don't have to talk about sports at all you know and then right i ended up you know running a website with like you know tens of millions of readers so it all worked right out. If it worked yeah, out for like, me, John, it'll work out for you, you know? Right. But, but I mean, like, what, what am I going to do? Am I just going to, like, I'm going to figure it out. It's the only option. Failure's not an option. So whatever, yeah. whatever, whatever, whatever I, I end up doing, I'm going to end up doing. And, um, and I'm embracing the challenge of uh, finding something new. Well, just don't do a don't don't pull a Jonathan Gannon and do any impermissible phone calls before your non-compete is up. You know? I would not do that because that would be illegal. Mm -hmm. Um. All right, so so before we go, let me ask you, what would you do? Oh, um, well, all cities throwing money at people, anyone. So <laughs> I would probably just take the cash there and, and and do that. I mean, I know you have to come back down to the city, but it's probably better hours yeah. than you're working, uh, depending on what what show you're on. Um, I would take your sponsors, and I would create like at least if something that you own or something that's yours or something that you can put your name on you know what i mean like it's nice to like have these jobs working for these organizations but it's cool to have your own thing too yeah you also have the barbershop yeah. coming out so you can create content out there and then you know have a sit down thing at the uh you could be the lebron of phoenixville um yeah no doubt your, your shop <laughs> no doubt and, and i mean honestly the all city and, and i know anthony uh very well the all city thing i i agree with you it's um because it's new and it's something totally different Mm. You know, like it, 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 it's intriguing. I, I don't know if there's a fit. I don't know if, if there'd be interest. I don't, I don't know. Like you had said, it, they're, they're, they're down in 10th Spring Garden. So it's like that I'm driving them back in the city, but it would be different hours and things like that. So, yeah. um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. All right. Well, if you're coming down 10th Spring Garden, hit me up. I'm right, uh, I'm right down the block. So, really? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, out, I'm out here in Philly. It's um, fish down. Fish down. Yeah. So, you know. Um, but uh but johnny we really appreciate it man good luck with that thing and hey listen we're i guess we're not part of your non-compete so you can come on and chop it up anytime if you get if you catch the uh eagles bug or the phillies bug or the sixers bug all right yeah I've been, I've been waiting to come on your show i haven't been able to because i had a job so you know i texted kevin and said let me come on crossing wait you i've been waiting wait, oh i guess were you not allowed to come on the show you could have well a little 30 minute hit well we, i mean are I we guess, persona non grata over no, there no we could have we could have made it work, but you're you're kind of the, you're commuting and doing show prep at that every time we record. Yeah, it. I'm, I'm too... trying to start a rivalry here, Kev. I'm trying to get some heat. Uh, okay, you want me to get a phone call from Yager off or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah what, once twelve o'clock hits, it's tough to do anything. But yeah. yeah. So hey, listen, you ask me again, I'll come on, no doubt. I appreciate yeah. it, man. Thank you so much. Awesome. All right, guys. All right, John. Good luck with everything. Cool. Uh, was it one Slots on back there, huh? Yeah. No, it was great. I mean, I love a good Johnny Marks unfiltered. Yeah, I mean, there's always, you know, I see people coming out and saying, like, on the post that he put on uh, Twitter the next day, like, oh, it doesn't have anything to do with your kids. Man, it's the same. It's it's about everything. I think he's, I think he hit the, I think that's kind of an undertold kind of thing. It's like, is it only ever about family, only ever about the commute, or only ever about money? No, it's not only ever about any one of those things, but 
you know, can you sacrifice missing softball practice a couple times a week and get your fix on Saturdays if, you know, you're making a million dollars or something like that? Yeah, I mean, sure, there's always going to be things that that in, influence it. But we have such a problem in this town of always thinking that it's only ever one. It's always got to be something more. Uh, there, there's always something more to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So it's it's probably a combination of all those things. But I, like, man, I give I give him credit because like, you know, like if you and I walked away from this tomorrow, I don't really know what the fuck I'd do. But like, we got a good thing going here. It takes a, it takes cojones to to say, yeah, I'm done. You know, that's PM drive, man. That's drive time radio. You know, people will people will die in that chair if they have to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so seriously, I mean, God, you know, a PM drive PM drive is not something you walk away from, but that's why I, I I for real, man. I commend John for just being like, you know, I'm gonna take the leap and see what's up. Sometimes you gotta do it too, because you could you just sit there and be like, Well, maybe, maybe not, maybe not. just jump off the deep end and gotta let's see gotta Got to work that creative muscle. Got to yeah. work. Can't be doing mm-hmm. the same thing for the whole time. But Look, man, gotta- you only live once, like the kids say, you know. YOLO. Uh, I think we should finish it on there. No, I want to talk about the Temple campus real quick. What? Um, <laughs> Where is this coming from? EJ Warner is transferring from Temple to Rice. Yeah, Harry Mays goes on Twitter and asks Kurt Warner why he's transferring. And he says he needed a change of he he says basically seeing what else is out there, uh opportunities. But um he needed a change off the field as much as on the field. So you're gonna you're gonna come at my campus and say that was the reasoning was because maybe no, Temple I'm, is having a tough time right now. I'm gonna of- ask you, I'm gonna ask you what your interpretation of Kurt Warner saying that is. Do you think right. he's taking a sh- I mean, it could be anything, it could just be like maybe he's in academics or maybe he doesn't like the weather up here or something like that. But did, like you know, people feel a certain way about that. Are people gonna like interpret that to mean that it's some like sh- shitty campus or something? I don't know, it kind of leaves the door open, you know. So this is Kurt Warner's tweet. There are a variety of reasons with one of them being he wanted to explore the possibilities that may have been out there. But at the end of the day, he needed a change and it was much off the field as on the field. Um, Yeah, you're right. It could be a variety of things. I think it's mostly due to football. Um, uh, Two back to back three and nine seasons. I Temple has struggled with the NIL uh, stuff. So I'm sure he wasn't getting anything good in Temple's AD, Arthur Johnson. Um, I guess NIL is technically an off the, I guess that would be an off the field thing. He doesn't understand NIL. Uh, There was a big article in the temple newspaper. Um, We had the guy on who, uh, who was leading it, Andy, Andy. Um, And the papers kind of came to him and they were like, tell us about NIL and how temple's doing a good job with it. And it was kind of like the administration, the faculty, the boosters, the, um, the people on the board, like I think it was the people on the board. One, this is the athletic board. One donates to Temple Sports. One mm. in the NIL. They've had at, before that article. They had one guy who was a former athlete donate to NIL. It was a baseball player. They cut that program in 2013. Now since that article come out, they've had two to three guys come in. So I mean, it was good that you know the papers and the reporters brought this stuff to light. Um, but you wrote about it last week or two weeks ago i mean him him to tri- going from temple to rice and i know rice is a great education and everything but we're not talking about education in terms of like college football and sports like ej warner thinks he can go to the nfl he's got an arm on him his dad played in the nfl he's going to get more opportunities than other other uh, prospects are going to get um him leaving temple for rice is just an embarrassment to temple like i'm i'm fully aboard on cut cut the football team no one will care if the football team is gone they're working at a, like a $40, $60 million deficit right now in the uh, in the Temple uh, Athletic Administration. I mean, well, they, that's pay, two, the thing that's, yeah, they yeah. pay $2 million every single game to yeah. rent out the link. $2 that's million ridiculous. Dollars ridiculous. to go three no. and nine. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, it, well, and I, I just, yeah, I mean, and regardless, too, of what Kurt Warner is really talking about there, I, I like the thing that just jumped out to me. It was like, uh, you know, Rice is not some world beater. I mean, JT Daniels actually left West Virginia last year to go to Rice. 
-hmm. and you know but he was like had been doing the carousel of going from place to place to place and that was like where he where what his appropriate level was at that time if ej warner transferred to look no we knew that ej warner was not going to ohio state Mm -hmm. right but if he transferred to maryland right i I do think no problem talking to my buddies and everything who are all temple fans we all thought he was going power five power five yeah i mean so for him to go like to even like to the top like if he went to the top of the aac like who won the who won the league this year i can't even remember our state no the 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 american oh the american yeah Uh, i think tulane might have won it tulane went 11 and 2 right tulane won it yeah if he transferred to tulane uh yeah, I, I that I get, but I mean, going from Temple to Rice is like go is like. I, we still, I I think we agree that's a lateral move, right? I mean, it's not. They won a couple more games in recent yeah. years, but not much. They're not world beaters, you know. The saddest part is he probably got paid more at Rice than he got paid. He gets paid at Temple. It's crazy. I mean, it's the biggest public co- college in the state. It, and that's the reality of the situation. I mean, yeah. everybody's transferring. Look at the teams that are playing in bowl games that didn't. Look at like the the high level teams playing in bowl games that aren't but aren't the playoff mm-hmm. right like they're all foregoing you know the 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 bowl games enter the draft and all that we're playing north carolina tonight north carolina's best receiver and their quarterback aren't sure, yeah, yeah. playing in this game if neil brown is in doused in mayonnaise by the end of the night then we're a fucking failure so you know, yeah. yeah 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 anyway yeah, so- my wife's calling me so i think that's probably the end of the show right okay all right. Well, hey, everybody. Hang on one sec. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks to Johnny Marks for coming on. Uh, we'll talk to you on Monday. Enjoy your uh, enjoy your keep the lights on work week. Yeah.